Hey there, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and today we're talking about adaptive martial arts. Yes, it's episode 467. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here. I'm the founder here. I do a bunch of things here, and you can see everything that I'm doing and the rest of the team is doing at whistlekick.com. One of the things you'll see over there is a store. We make a bunch of stuff. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you can save 15% on any of that stuff. And if you want to support us, if you want this show to continue, support is kind of important. Whether that's through a purchase or following us on social media at Whistlekick, leaving us a review on Google or Facebook or anywhere else that seems to make sense. Or you can support the Patreon, patreon.com slash Whistlekick. And if you do that, we're even going to give you original content that other people don't get to see. If you want to see everything going on with this show, there's a whole separate website. It's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And that's where you'll find links and photos and videos to the bi-weekly episodes. Yes, we do this twice a week. Monday's an interview. Thursday's a topic show, sometimes like today, with interviews. And it's all under the heading of connecting and inspiring and educating those in the traditional martial arts community. Today's episode's a little different because we have two people on in two different segments talking about the same subject. Just a couple days ago on episode 466, we had Mr. Jason Davis on who is the founder of the Adaptive Martial Arts Association, a group dedicated to supporting those with specific challenges that still want to involve themselves and benefit from martial arts. And it was a wonderful conversation. And when we set that up, he wanted us to talk to other people in the group. And we thought that was a great idea. So we're releasing this episode. I recorded all three on the same day. It was a, it was a marathon day for conversation. I was a little fried. And hopefully that doesn't come through, but had the opportunity to talk to two other people. One, Master Kelly Thomas, who will be up first, a martial arts instructor for many, many years. Someone who I've known for quite a few years, wonderful person, who is supportive and instructing adaptive martial artists. Up second is Mrs. Patty Thomas. No, they're not related. I had to ask. An occupational therapist who is an advisor to the Adaptive Martial Arts Association, someone who is helping make sure that the materials that martial arts schools have are adequate and supportive to the end of instructing adaptive martial artists. I learned a ton on this episode, and I think you will too. Whether or not you're an instructor, whether or not you are or plan to teach adaptive martial artists. Now, my hope is that you'll at least consider it, and if you attend a school that doesn't, Maybe you'll speak to your school owner or your instructor because martial arts is for everyone and the benefits are, well, I don't need to tell you about the benefits. You know, if you didn't know, you probably wouldn't be listening to this show. So let's start off. Here I am with Master Thomas. Master Thomas, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. It's nice to talk to you again. It's been a couple of years. It has been a couple of years. It flies by so fast. It does. It does. And, and the, the disappointing thing as I'm getting older is I'm realizing time goes faster. That's unfair. Uh, it should, should go the other way, shouldn't it? It absolutely should. What, what's, that, uh, what's that famous quote? Youth is wasted on the young. It is. And I see my young children wasting it all the time. <laughs> well, we're doing something a little bit different here. And I want to thank you for participating. And, and the audience already knows a lot about what's going on because I've set it up in the intro, but we don't quite know what's going on yet because we're in the middle of it. We're in the thick of this. And, and there's a second part to this conversation that I'll be recording with someone else once we're done here. And I want to thank you for trusting me in being flexible with some kind of format concept thing that we don't even know what's going on yet. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Figure we'll it out. just wing it. Yeah, exactly. I love winging it Ooh. because it requires Ooh. the least amount of preparation and you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not. That's right. Martial artists have to be prepared for anything. That's right. We do. We do. And what a perfect segue. And it almost sounds like I set you up for that one. And I didn't intentionally, uh -huh. but I love it. <laughs> you know, we're here today to talk about adaptive martial arts. And specifically, what an instructor can do, what an instructor shouldn't do, and, and everything around that subject of teaching adaptive sometimes called disabled students in a martial arts setting. Before we get there, 
because you didn't just walk in off the street one day and say, I'm going to put on a uniform and a belt and start teaching adaptive martial artists. You've been teaching martial arts for quite a long time. So why don't you give us a few minutes about how you got started and bring us up to today? Okay. Um, I actually started uh, in Taekwondo, uh, International Taekwondo, back in 1991. Um, I was 11 years old, and my father signed me up for uh, self-defense reasons. Uh, things can't, you know, uh, life gets in the way, so I came in and out of martial arts. Took me about 10 years to get to my black belt, um, which I got in. Uh, 2001, um, started my own school about 13 years ago, uh, received my sixth degree black belt this past March, um, and started, uh, the school's called, uh, Taekwondo Kicks, which stands for, uh, keep fit, inner strength, confidence, kinship, and self-defense. So if I'm doing the math right, you know, we've got 25 years or so of martial arts experience. You've been, you've been at this a bit. A lot of it, yes. Yeah, and one of the things that I know about you that the audience may not know is that you are an incredibly active instructor. <laughs> <laughs> Most people who, who wear the hat of martial arts instructor teach, I would say, four to six classes a week. And there's nothing wrong with that. I am not throwing stones. When I had my own school, I taught four and it was overwhelming. How many classes a week do you teach? Uh, I average between 25 and 30. Okay. And the reason that I bring that up, it's not, it's not to give you the opportunity to brag or, or, to, or to say, wow, that's amazing or, or anything. Other than it means you have worked with a lot of students over a lot of hours. And if we consider skill, and I consider instruction a skill. If we think about skill as being roughly correlated with the experience of time and involvement, I think it's fair to say that you have more teaching experience than the majority of martial arts instructors out there at any, at any age or rank. And again, this is not to compare in any kind of negative way. I don't want people to, uh, to feel hurt. If, if you think I'm pointing out, because I'm not, I'm simply trying to point out that Master Thomas, you've worked with a lot of students and that gives you, as far as I'm concerned, the qualification to talk about what we're going to talk about today. Well, thank you. So thanks. Now we're here to talk about adaptive martial arts. And can you talk about, I, I know that your involvement with the Adaptive Martial Arts Association is not something that's been going on for, for, years because that organization hasn't been around for years and years. Do you remember your first, we'll, we'll call them adaptive student, and what that was like for you as an instructor? Yes, actually the very first class in the past 25 years that I've been involved in uh, Taekwondo and the martial arts. Um, when I was a child, the martial arts was geared more towards you know, the 20, 30, 40 year olds and very few kids. Now, when, and when I started teaching again, it has totally seemed to have flopped where it's mostly for kids now. Parents are signing up their children. And most of the time, these parents are looking for help and support with their uh, children with um, ADHD, autism, focus, all the uh, benefits that a student can receive from any martial art um, is really speaking to these parents of special needs kids and as an outlet and a support system for them. So right from day one, um, I had children um, with ADHD and actually my first adult student um, had MS. What's that like? Because if you've never been a martial arts instructor, if you've never started your own school, you might not know the fear, the anxiety of getting out there and saying, I have to take everything I've ever been taught and teach it. But when you're talking about someone who's adaptive, now you're adding the complexity of teaching that to someone whose body may not move the same way or have the same capacity as mine. 
Right. Well, um, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, I'm a mom. Um, my daughter had to do some um, occupational therapy when she was an infant. So I got to see how you have to change things a little bit to make things work. Um, uh, I myself have uh, fibromyalgia, which um, means that there are certain things that I can't do, my body can't do, um, having had a, a few hip replacements as well. So some of it is my own experience of understanding that when somebody asks me to do something that I may have to change it a bit. Um, but also, um, you know, back when I first got my black belt, um, my instructors had said, if you really want to learn how to teach, teach kids. And when you, when you have to teach kids, you need to learn how to speak at their level and their language, which may mean they're changing the explanations a little bit so that they understand. And so when working with uh, an adaptive student, um, I feel it's the same way. Um, that you can't necessarily, or I can't necessarily be as strict, like, you know, with a certain kick, you know, perhaps, you know, the real name is step behind sight piercing kick. Well, they're not going to understand that on day three or four or even a month from now. So I've trained, I've changed the name to being Thomas the train kick. You know, where you say, you know, uh, caboose comes to engine and the engine kicks and they can see that and they can understand that. So I think that um, is one of the, the first things that I learned is that, you know, I might not be able to use the same terminology um, that I was taught. Mm. That makes all kinds of sense. And yeah, it, it, it's a battle between the traditional aspects of martial arts and the desire to actually teach in an effective way to the person that you're trying to reach. And it can, and I don't mean battle in that it's a negative thing, but it can be a challenge. It can be a conflict at times. And, and you just gave a great example of how you're working with that. And I would expect you're doing that because it works better. And anybody who teaches, who teaches kids knows you got to change it. You've got to change it. And you know, there's only, they can only understand so much. Um, but I think it's with anybody. Um, I, I often, uh, you know, tell my adult students also when I first teach them a, a pattern or a kata, I tell them, I'm going to teach you like you're three years old and take no offense to it, but you know, you'll understand it and it makes sense to them. And then you add in the, you know, the, the real terminology and the real explanation, but in order, you just kind of peel back the layers and with adaptive, you know, it just may take a little longer to, you know, add the other layers. You just wait until they're ready. And so over the years, as you've had students come in who have needed different words, different movements as you've changed things, because I've been to some of your classes and I've seen, I mean, there, there's quite the rage in, in ages, as you said, you know, it's, it's kids, it's adults, it's all over the place. And anybody who's taught knows that even among, in theory, everyone having the same physical capacity, they don't, everybody's different. So how have you started to adjust, not just the, the language, but the physical expectations and instruction for people based on their needs? What I do, um, especially when somebody first starts, um, explain to them that, you know, the warm ups that we do are, you know, designed to push everybody, everybody do their best um, and hope that somebody who physically can't do it as well as everyone else doesn't feel frustrated. But I think one of the things that works in my class is 95% of my classes are family style classes which like you said, it's mixed of ages. So I can have a four-year-old all the way up through grandparents in the same class. And so when a special needs person is in there, well, there's obviously, you know, a preschooler who's not doing push-ups correctly. Um, there are grandparents who are having difficulty doing push-ups. 
And the fact that, you know, I just tell them, you know, 15 push-ups, the best of your ability, they don't feel as though there's a light on them where everybody's watching them and, oh, they can't do the push-ups correctly. Well, because nobody's watching anybody, everybody's just doing the best that they can. So they feel that they're just a part of the group. Um, and, you know, we wait till everybody's done and we just move on. So I make it a point that I don't comment or correct certain physical uh, abilities or strength. Um, we do our best uh, to help uh, that student. Sometimes it means they have to hold on to somebody's hand. Um, sometimes it means that they do need to use their walker. Um, or need help getting up off the floor, but um, I, I'm able to do that because of the support of also my students, because they've seen it work since day one, to make that person feel uh, a part of the group and to realize that they are improving, you know, every day. Let's take um, an example that I think further takes us down this path in this conversation but it's a temporary one. Let's imagine you have someone that's been in your school for a year or two and they break an arm and you know they're in a sling, they're in a cast and push-ups come up in the warm-up. You're, I would assume you're not going to not do push-ups in the warm-up until that person's arm is fully healed, you know, six, eight weeks later. I'm assuming you're not calling special attention to them based on what you've just expressed, but how do you handle that? Uh... That's actually happened uh, uh, quite a few times. Uh, <laughs> I had a feeling. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, I broke my arm. I, you know, uh, I can't do push-ups. It's like, yes, I, I understand that. So instead, um, you know, do extra crunches or do um, jumping jacks or do, you know, something else. You know, we've learned several different ab exercises. You know, so just do or march in place, you know, as long as the student is doing something. You know, I I'm not running a, a, a push up class, so I kind of look at, you know, what am I actually trying to teach here? Uh, what is my main goal? Doing the perfect push up is not one. So as long as they're trying and doing their best and doing something, we just run with it. And, and that that makes sense to me, and that's what I would I would expect. Now, of course, when it's something a little more permanent, let's take an example, and I'll, and I'll let you choose one based on you know what you've worked with. But when when someone comes into your your class, and I, I think at this point we can kind of let's say let's say split, because you have some folks who are adaptive who aren't as extreme with their needs as others, right? I mean, you've got some who, you know, maybe there's, there's an issue with one leg, but both arms work and, 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 and the other leg works just fine. And then you might have somebody else who can't stand without the aid of, of some kind of hardware, you know, wheelchair or crutches or, or, or some, you know, some kind of heavy duty braces. And their needs are going to be dramatically different and they might need to be in a separate class. So let's continue to work down this spectrum. If you have someone who can participate in a standard class, but with some adjustments, how do you handle that? So the person can be in the regular family class. Yeah. Um, we just have them, uh, you know, do the best that they can. Um, I do still believe in uh, traditional patterns and stuff like that. So it, sometimes it takes them longer to learn a pattern. Um, I've also gone ahead uh, as type one doists, we tend to uh, promote students every three months. Um, I've kept with the traditional belts, but have added a few mini hops um, between the belts for, you know, either because of age or for the young kids or ability. Um, so that they still get to go to promotional testing, still, you know, get to celebrate their um, advancement, their work, but they're only going up, you know, instead of uh, from yellow to high yellow, they're going from yellow to medium yellow. 
And then, you know, maybe in three months, they'll get to the high yellow. So they still see a, a progression. They still see a celebration. But it's maybe slower. And it usually is. Um, uh, and so we just, you know, if they need help, we do that. We've got some mats. Um, and uh, we just support them in whatever they need mm. if they're in a regular class. It sounds like it's pretty flexible. And that not only is that how you do it, but probably how it has to be done. Yes. Um, I, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that um, I do teach family style classes. You have to be flexible. Um, and just to kind of understand you know, where my concept is, I like to, um, uh, my, cl- my students and I often kind of joke, I mean, this is the, the Christmas season where we're kind of the um, uh, island of misfit toys um, when we come together, because uh, it's all different ages, all different whatever. Um, and what Whenever I teach, my main reason for teaching is to increase a student's self-confidence and self-worth. The martial art piece is just, the Taekwondo is a tool for me to do that. Um, And I do, you know, we, I am, you know, strict on learning certain techniques and stuff like that to a certain point when they get to a certain rank. But I realize that, you know, I'm not turning out these, you know, grand championship competitors or, you know, whatever, that's not my goal. Um, And that's not the goal of the students that I teach. So it allows me to be more flexible and understanding, you know, when a student can't do a a turning kick, Um, you know, they have to step around and then pick up their foot. Um, But that person to do just understand that concept of, you know, physically turning their body and then picking up a leg is a lot of work. And it took months for them to get that. So they still deserve the respect and the celebration of all of that hard work. You know, just because they can't necessarily do, you know, a 360 jump turning kick, um, which is difficult that technique that they just did by stepping and kicking was just as hard for them as it is for somebody who is fit to learn to do a, a jumping 360 turning kick. And I think, and, and this, you know, comes from me being heavily involved in the martial arts, but not so much as an instructor, but it seems like this is one of the reasons that martial arts makes so much sense for the adaptive community is that because it can be so flexible and so individualized. Do you agree? I do agree. Um, I've actually had uh, many uh, therapists, um, counselors encourage their, uh, their patients or the patient's families to seek out martial arts as a way to, to support them. Uh, The martial arts is unique because, you know, even though it's thought of as an individual sport, you're still part of a team. Um, so it's, you still get, and especially uh, adaptive students who oftentimes may feel not included in things. It gives them the sense of belonging to a group. But as the instructor, I teach the individuals in the group. Mm-hmm. You, know, every, you know, every person is doing what they can do. It's not like it's not like being on the soccer team where everybody has to be doing the same drill at the same time. Everybody can go at their own speed. I can take care of each person by themselves, but they feel like they're part of a community. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Now, let's let's look at the other side of kind of that split when you have someone who maybe their their individual needs are going to exceed what can be handled in a standard class setting first off how do you know a lot of it how do you know usually is meeting the person or having them come to a class and 
watching and I make an assessment about, okay, so I have, you know, 20, uh, 15, 20 people in class. There's, it's an hour class, so I can only spend so many minutes per student if you want to look at, you know, student minutes per class. If I feel that this person, in order to accomplish their goals, needs more than a couple of minutes of my time, then I would definitely suggest that that person go to an adaptive class where everything can be slowed down um, and more like, uh, and it also depends on how good their gross motor skills are, um, sometimes verbal. Um, I do work with some students that are nonverbal, um, which can be a challenge in, in a large class. Um, so when I look at what can I do and if I'm capable of giving them what they need or what they're looking for in a regular class, I say that's great. If it's more than that, then I definitely, you know, suggest that they do an adaptive class where I can slow everything down. That makes sense. Do you have any kind of limits on the number of people that you would have in an adaptive class? You talked about that metric of student minutes, which is something I hadn't thought of before, but it makes all kinds of sense. So are you monitoring that as a number? In the future, yes. Um, right now that the class size is um, small, I think we usually have six or seven, um, but I certainly wouldn't want any more than 10. I believe. Um, but it also depends because the longer a student is in that class, your hope is that they become more independent and stronger. So the longer that they're in the class, the less time they're going to need from me. And now their job is to be a leader or an example or a helper. So it kind of like, you know, comes around full circle. Um, but it's definitely something that I'm needing to be aware of um, because there are some times when, you know, you have to stop class to take time to work with one person um, and everyone needs to, you know, expect that and understand it um, and parents have to understand it. Um, so that makes it a little uh, safer and easier to do in an adaptive class because I can just say, okay, we're going to stop. We're going to deal. We're going to work with this one little thing and everybody's okay with it because they understand how important it is. That makes sense. And so what else? Because I don't know what other questions to ask. So if we kind of flipped it, you know, and put it all under the heading of what don't I know? So I can't ask the questions about it. What things would you want other school owners and instructors to know about teaching adaptive students oh boy that put me on the spot um <laughs> i'm good at that yes i know um i think the big thing and and i'll be um i catch myself doing this at the same time sometimes you know you you hear from a a, a parent somebody calls wanting to do class um and the person walks in and immediately goes to my head, oh, can I help this person? And, you know, I, you've heard people say that, you know, when you see a, a handicapped person, you don't necessarily mean to, but everybody kind of shies away. Or, you know, you don't look. I had uh, uh, one of my students had, uh, had an accident, was in a wheelchair. She's not in a wheelchair all the time, but she was one that said, it's funny, you get into a wheelchair and nobody will make eye contact with you. So when you first have an adaptive person come in, um, oftentimes I get scared and I get nervous. You know, what if I say something wrong? Um, what if I do something wrong? What if I offend this person? Um, and I kind of just take a deep breath and, you know, introduce myself and, you know, just always do the best that I can. Um, you know, have I made mistakes? Yes. But I think the biggest reason, um, and I could be wrong, but I think the biggest reason adaptive 
people come to a martial art or the families are looking for a martial art. It has a lot to do with that inclusion. And, you know, just coming up and saying hello and welcoming them to the group is something that doesn't happen uh, very often. And, you know, to treat them as, you know, part of the group. Um, even those that uh, I work with that um, are somewhat nonverbal, um, when I call their name, um, they're supposed to try to say, yes, ma'am. And, you know, they do because that's, you know, the martial arts. You're supposed to say, yes, ma'am. So you know that they're doing the best they can and you just let them, you just let them do that. But you don't want to necessarily allow them to do nothing. So it's really trying to find that fine line of how much to push to get them to excel and not to break them. But it's the same with teaching any student. Yeah. Yeah. You know, every student has that point. So, you know, I think every student, whether it's a, whether it's a special needs student or not comes into the martial arts with a special need, whether it's an emotional need, whether it's a confidence need, um, and to try to figure out what that need is and to address it. Um, and again, by pushing them just enough to excel and not humiliating them or deflating them um, is a job. So looking at an adaptive student is like looking at any other student, just that their needs can be more visual I think, and obvious. Yeah, I you know, it's funny, you're, you're connecting some dots for me that I hadn't considered until just now. One of the things that I've said on the show in, in talking with people is that everyone comes into martial arts looking for something. Everybody has something in their lives that is, is missing, is lacking, and they're hoping that martial arts will fill it. Otherwise, they wouldn't go. They wouldn't spend the time. They wouldn't spend the money. And to look at everyone as having that lack, that missing puzzle piece, puts everybody on the, the same page. And I think it makes our job as instructors, I'm putting myself in that, that bucket, it makes the instructor's job maybe not easier, but simpler because you can work from that place of what is it this person's looking for and teaching to that and within those capacities, regardless of whether they're considered adaptive or not. Yes, I agree. And um, in fact, uh, for homework, um, when they test the first time, regardless of you know their age or whatever, um, for me, they have to write a paper or draw a picture if they're young saying why they're starting Taekwondo. So they've been in Taekwondo for about three months. It's like, why did you start? What are you looking for? And you'll get a various, you know, answers and, you know, that mom made me or, you know, whatever, and some more thought out um, reasons. But I tell them when I assign the, the work, I said, why you walked in through the door is one reason. And usually the reason you stay will change. And, but it's always important to remember why you started. Um, because I think a lot of people, when they first look into the martial arts, are looking for like a, a blanket general reason, like for fitness or for self-defense or whatever. Anyone who's been in the martial arts long enough um, knows that there's a deeper thing there. And, you know, once you can get them to admit what their broad reason is, you can usually kind of pick what their um, true uh, or, you know, um, inner meaning or reason for coming to class. Great. Yeah. Make, makes all kinds of sense. Is there anything else you want people to know? I'm out of questions. You're out of questions. I'm out of questions. <laughs> you've done a great, you've, well, you've answered everything I wanted to know. And I, I'm, I'm trying to speculate what others listening might want to know, but you, you're, you're doing a great job checking boxes. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, when I teach, um, I'm often reminded that the best advice that my, uh, my instructor gave me was um, to teach from the heart. Um, you can't go wrong if you teach from the heart. And, you know, the students, whether they're adaptive or uh, non-adaptive, I mean, this is going to sound really corny, but it's the holiday season. Why not? You know, everybody just wants to be loved and accepted and, you know, supported. And to me, as an instructor in this 
you know, uh, society now, which is not as uh, supportive and loving as we all wish it would be, um, that really becomes more of our responsibility is, is to have an, a, a loving, supportive environment um, for our students and, you know, opening it up to uh, adaptive special needs uh, students and really see that what they do and uh, for the day is is miraculous and and appreciate that so a lot of the things that we take uh, for granted um, these these people these students have to work um, extra hard uh, to do uh, what we find to do very simple um, just walking um, and uh, to appreciate that and uh, support them and helps to, uh, oh, maybe knock us down a peg um, when, we, when we see uh, uh, what other people are doing and, and struggling with. And, and I think, uh, like you said, uh, put us all on the same page, put us all on the same level. That was some great conversation. And I've been fortunate enough to work with some of Master Thomas's students to watch her teach, not in these adaptive classes, but it's pretty clear to me that she's a wonderful choice for the local class and a great example of how a passionate martial arts instructor can reach a new demographic. I mean, really, there's no downside to this. And I think that's my favorite thing about it, is we're opening up martial arts to another group of people who benefit tremendously. And everybody wins in that exchange. And that's my favorite thing to do in business. How do we find ways where everybody wins? My second conversation, as I said in the intro, was with Mrs. Patty Thomas, an occupational therapist who works with the Adaptive Martial Arts Association and advises them and, and helps provide the materials that instructors will need. She's coming at this from a completely different angle. She is not a martial artist, which I think is an asset in this case, because let's face it, martial arts can often be a closed group of people, very much rooted in tradition to the point of fear of change. And I think that that's the number one thing holding programs like this back. We got into some great stuff. I came away with a much better understanding of what is needed and how to operate in these settings. And I hope you do as well. Here we go. Mrs. Thomas, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. You hold a distinction in that you are one of very few non-martial artists to ever come on the show. Wow. Yeah. I've, Interesting. Thinking, let's see. I, I can think of one. There's definitely one other. You, you, you might be only the second. I keep contemplating if I'm going to finally just end up studying <laughs> under someone. <laughs> well, you could probably guess by my opinion on the subject. And, <laughs> right. and, and, I, and I bet everybody else listening right now is saying you should you should but of right. course that's not that's not why you're here we didn't bring you on to try and intervene this is not you know <laughs> non-martial artist intervention radio yeah. uh, this is this is a subject episode we're talking about adaptive martial arts and you're affiliated with the organization that we've been talking about this week so why don't you talk about how you got started in cool. your profession and then how you got started with the organization okay sure um, well, I'm an occupational therapist, um, have always known um, pretty much for my adult life that I um, like two things. One is to solve problems and the other is to help people and help make things accessible to all people. So if you combine those two, pretty much end up with occupational therapy. Um, really lucky to be able to say I love my profession and um, have been practicing for 20, my 24th year of practice and have been in Vermont since 2000. Prior to this, I was uh, in Massachusetts. I graduated from Boston University and then relocated with my family to Vermont for a more quiet little lifestyle. And what does an occupational therapist do? Let's, let's do that, because I, I, I'm aware that I know what that is, but everyone listening might not. That's actually a really challenging question to answer, and it's part of the course of study when, you, when you're in college for occupational therapy, because we actually do a wide range of things. But if you were going to put it in one sentence, sort of in a nutshell, occupational therapists 
help people with any kind of challenge due to disability, illness, accident, um, access what they need to be doing on a regular basis. So if there's an, a reason why they can't access something due to a disability or impairment of some sort, um, we, as the occupational therapist, can be supportive, usually as part of a team, to help that person access what it is that they want to do. And can you give a, a couple common examples of sure. what your job entails? Okay. Sure. So I'm actually a school-based occupational therapist. So I help students who are unable to access public education for some reason um, by making accommodations and adaptations, helping them access their education. Um, in the medical field, an occupational therapist might help a person who has had a stroke uh, become better able to care for themselves and return home. Um, those are two really concrete, easy examples, but we run the gamut for everything that we do from driver rehab to hand therapy to um, visual rehabilitation, helping people make accommodations in public arena. Pardon my dog. It's quite all right. <laughs> That'll be edited out. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I, I think that gives us a good starting point here. So when right. we when we look at this organization of adaptive martial arts mm -hmm. and I mean, and when we can even have a broader conversation because I, I'm not going to pretend that there aren't instructors out there working with martial artists who have needs and there are responding so to those needs. Are, yes. I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I know of some, you know, I'm yes. friends with some good I've had some on the show. Yes. And, and it's wonderful work and I fully support it. And that's, that's why we're doing, you know, why we're having this conversation, why we're putting these, these resources into this, because I, I want more martial arts schools to offer these programs. Yes. So how did you get linked up with this group? How did you, how'd you meet Jason? Well, Jason and I live in the same small town in Vermont and I've um, known him for a long time. I didn't necessarily know his personal story with how helpful martial arts has been for him. He was looking to, you know, really raise the AMAA to a, a higher level and was hoping to get professionals on to consult PTs and OTs um, and other professionals who might be able to weigh in and sort of uh, just raise the level of professionalism of the organization and what we have to offer in the local class. So he asked me to join and he and I had a conversation about it and that was about three years ago and we've been going strong since. Okay. Now, when you look at what's going on, when you look at the idea of taking someone who has some kind of challenge, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we can, I mean, that they, it runs the gamut. I mean, it's, it's pretty broad from, from something that could be temporary, I suppose, to something that is, is full time and, and, possibly going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And we're all looking at this from the perspective of wanting to help the student. You know, the, the instructor wants to convey as much as they can. And, and, and I could imagine that there might be some circumstances where the instructor gets really excited and, and maybe isn't quite sure how to reach that student and how right. to convey that information in a way that not only is effective, but appropriate. Right. And, you know, there, there, there's concerns about what language do people use mm -hmm. and how much is too much and how much is not enough and how do you balance all these things with, with being respectful. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big undertaking. It sure is, yeah. It can feel that way, but it doesn't have to be that big. Okay. I guess I'd first start by saying, for me, as we've stated, I'm not a martial artist. But in my observations of the local class of children with disabilities who are participating, my um, observation has been that martial arts, while it is um, sort of a nice community and a group activity, it's also a very individualized sport. Yeah. Which is why it can be so beneficial to people with disabilities because you are individualizing for almost, I would, I'm going to take a leap and say that people who are instructing in martial arts are individualizing for each of their students. I don't think you'd ever stand in front of a group and everybody's gonna do exactly the same thing with the exact same result every class. Right, right, the good ones anyway. Right. The good ones will. <laughs> there you go. It, <laughs> <laughs> and so when it comes to having a student with a challenge, whatever that might be, you can call it a disability and it may be labeled as such or not, 
but all learners are different. It's just a matter of the level of accommodation that's going to be necessary for the for a particular student to progress in your in your program. And when someone says, you know, I I think I want to do this. I think I want to open my doors to adaptive students. And and maybe they're not sure if they want to offer separate classes or classes for or, or include adaptive students in generalized classes. This was something that Master Thomas and I talked about in the previous segment. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd like your your feedback on this too. How do we know? If we meet someone, if we meet a potential student, how do we know if they're going to be more successful in a class with everyone or in a class that is specifically for adaptive students? Um, that's, you know, that's interesting to think about. I think when it comes to working with a person who has challenges, it's important to have a conversation with them or their people if they happen to be nonverbal or their adults if they happen to be minors and find out in other areas of their life what works for them. So you would, if you find that you have a student, let's say, for example, a student with autism, and that student is in general able to access the everyday programming in their school with typical age peers, then chances are they might do the same in your program and be in with the general class. If they're a person who maybe needs a smaller group in the the rest of their lives, then you might do that as well. I'm so sorry. No, it's all right. It's all right. Don't worry about it. We've had far worse. (laughs) If they are a student who needs uh, more intensive accommodations and adaptations in other areas, you know, what have they done at school? What have they done? Have they participated in other sports? And what were the accommodations necessary? Um, one of the things that's really important is to include the family and help they'll, they know their child best or their adult best. Um, and just have a conversation and set a plan. And don't, um, don't hesitate to, you know, do trial and error. You know, try. I always like to go with, there's an expression we use in education called least restrictive environment. So try a child in a general class. Sometimes they might need um, one or two separate lessons or individualized or small group lessons and then could end up going, maybe a mixture of both. But I would say individualize their program as best you can. One of the things that's coming to mind as you're, you're talking about these conversations is I would imagine that in in having adaptive students, whether that's in a generalized class or in a separate class, there's likely to be more need for conversation before or after class with either the student or, as you termed it, their people. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of martial arts schools don't have a lot of that dialogue because life is busy. Right. You, know, you run class to class to class mm-hmm. and you don't have time to have even a five-minute conversation with every student after the class. Right. But the, the needs of an adaptive student might require more outside of class time. Right. That, that could be true. Um, I think usually um, if you know the right questions to ask, you know, that might be something that you could, once you get used to having students with differences, you'll, I think part of it is a comfort level, really, Jeremy. Like once you start getting used to having students with disabilities, um, your comfort level, there's, and I I can't speak for all people, but I know myself when I first started working with people with disabilities, it it was a little bit at times uncomfortable because we're afraid of what we don't understand. We can be. And um, we're afraid for them. We're afraid for the other person. We don't understand. And it's uncomfortable. We think we might never want to be blind or never want to have to use a wheelchair to get around. And so that can be intimidating. But, you know, we're all people first. And if, you know, you just strike the conversation, you'll find that we're all more alike than we are different. And, um, Sometimes just having that conversation once, then twice, then three, then you get more comfortable, you get more, you get better versed on the topic, you get better versed in the community, and um, I think it becomes easier as you, as you go along. Now, I would expect that the number one thing that is going to hold someone back from offering adaptive students a place in their school would be fear, and not, not fear 
uh, of anything really negative, but almost fear that they're going to do a poor job, fear right. that they're going to harm the student right. or, or, or inadvertently say or do something that, that comes across disrespectful. Mm -hmm. So how do we bridge that gap? How do we give them the knowledge to make sure that they feel comfortable giving it a try? Well, I think first, like I said, conversations um, with the student and their family. Um, for me, I don't know if instructors would feel comfortable for, for this, but for me, when I encounter a person who has a condition or a difference in the way they work and learn that I've not experienced, I'll often say I'm not, I haven't worked with, a, with a, a child with this, but I'm going to learn and we can learn together and I need you to let me know what's working and what isn't. Um, that's first and foremost um, one way to become more comfortable. There are resources, there's, you know, there's so many resources available for people to become you know, better. We all, I think, I, I speak for most people, we say we all want to do better at, at what we do and doing a little bit of research or just reaching out asking for help there's a, there's a lot of help available now i would imagine that there's tremendous value you know i'm thinking about this from the the perspective of the martial arts instructor anyone who's ever taught anything knows that the moment you start teaching something it becomes an educational opportunity for you Mm -hmm. You know, to be able to do something is one thing, to be able to teach it is another. But I would imagine that being able to teach it to someone who moves very differently or learns very differently is that much more of a challenge and, and a wonderful opportunity to better understand the things that you're teaching. Right. For sure. So I'm not sure how you, you mentioned resources. Mm -hmm. Are these resources that you can mention or that we can link? For sure. In the show sure. notes, maybe you could send us some stuff. Yeah. Um, so, well, first let's talk about the Adaptive Martial Arts Association. And so that yeah, is our mission is to provide resources for um, schools and dojos and teachers of martial arts and families um, <clears throat> to be able to approach this and not have to have that fear and know that there are um resources and people behind them, people who have tried it and done it, things that work. Um, you can reach out to the Adaptive Martial Arts Association. We have a therapeutic consulting staff um, and we will often, you know, um, help folks with broad general questions. Um, we can point them in the direction for specific questions about specific students. Understandably, we can't give specific therapeutic advice for a given student uh, that they're teaching, but in, in broad terms, we can tell the things that are known to work for certain different types of dis people with different dis disabilities. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, um, you know, the research, there are research articles out there that support martial arts for all kinds of different learners, um, especially for people with developmental disabilities, physical disabilities, uh, another up and coming area that's pretty becoming very well researched is um, folks with PTSD and training in the martial arts, um, autism spectrum disorder, which is, as we all know, on the rise. Um, it's unlikely that you would have any area of the United States anyway where you don't have potential students that are falling into that diagnosis. And there's, um, you know, depending on what the person brings with them, there's also agencies and organizations that um, can give you broad terms, not specific to martial arts, but how best to work with a person with cerebral palsy or how best to work with a person with visual impairment. Um, so <clears throat> if you go to the Adaptive Martial Arts website, um, there are links and um, resources and you can reach out to us directly and we're certainly going to link that now you and i talked a little bit about this before we started recording mm -hmm. and I, I just heard you kind of uh almost bobble some words right and so i want to talk about the language component yes. because I, I think that this is such a big deal for those of us who are not adaptive right because we don't want to screw it up we don't right. want to hurt anyone's feelings never, nobody wants to hurt anybody's feelings but here's my question, Jeremy. Like, who is the they who decides what 
any minority group wants to be called. Like, who are they that made that decision? And is there, is there a, a whole group that's allowed to speak for the whole population? And so you, I think you run into that when you're talking about any minority group. Yeah. Um, but I do know that in general, we want to use person first language. And part of the reason for that is because people don't necessarily want to be identified or identify others by their disability. Right. So if you say a disabled person, then the first thing you're talking about is that they're they're not able. Right. Right. Um, I've heard this and I don't know if it's true, but I love the story that there is not. In some languages, there is not a translation for the word disability because you can only have a disability if you're comparing one to others. Right. Yeah. So everybody's able, but some are disabled or unable. That makes sense. Right. And so there's yeah. no translation for it. And so people are just respected for what their abilities are. Right. So if your ability is that you can be in a chair that happens to have wheels and still engage in upper extremity exercises that are martial arts, then you are a martial artist. You don't happen to be standing up while you do it. That doesn't mean you're disabled or unable. Right. We did a, a whole episode on how do you define someone as or as not a martial artist? And I take the very broad ap- approach that if you have done some martial arts and got something out of it and hope that someday you'll do it again, if you're not currently, you're a mm-hmm. martial artist. Right. You know, it's not any physical standard. It's not any mental standard. It's not any time standard. It's, is this thing that you do? Yeah. Martial arts to you. Right. And going back to your question about differently abled people, people with challenges, people with disabilities. I, as I had said to you in in an earlier conversation, I do fumble at times because who knows what the right word is. Um, In some populations, in some um, circles, um, some people with varying diagnoses want their diagnosis to be the first thing they say. You know, an autistic person might be Mm -hmm. politically correct or might be comfortable for someone whereas people with autism might be. I think if you can ask the person and their family what they prefer, but if you're not sure, nobody's ever going to be offended if you say the student with challenges or the student who learns differently, or sometimes you can say adaptive martial arts. The adaptive student is sometimes okay, but I think if you use the person first and then ask after, use the person first language first and then ask after if there's a different preference they would like. Sure. And I would imagine that if you're teaching from a place of compassion, and in the previous segment, we, we talked with Master Thomas and talked about, you know, kind of leading with love. If you're doing that, you're going to be using their name right. far, far more than you are their diagnosis or their or label. Right. La- yeah, their label. Yeah. So it it matters because it's a barrier that we as instructors might put up, but I think it matters far more to us. Yeah. as that barrier, and mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be there. Right, right. So let's talk about the the physical concern. You know, there, there there's the language. So now the physical concern. We talked about you know having those conversations with with the person or with with their people, but still translating that knowledge into a class and into an individualized program for that student can be really challenging and can be really scary because if they've never done martial arts before, Mm -hmm. it's entirely possible that there are things that come up that, oh, we didn't even realize that this student would excel at that and could handle it at a much higher level than we'd imagined or the opposite end of that spectrum there that, oh, you know, this particular motor pattern isn't something that comes up often and they're having a a tougher time with it than we we had expected. Yeah. So how might we handle those sorts of things? Well, again, I think you approach each person individually. Um, you would take probably whatever your very basic intro course is and have the person who's engaged in the adaptive programming in, in front of you. Now you've already had a conversation, hopefully at least with the student and hopefully with the family. And you try and you see. And if it seems that things um, are too challenging, I think you would lighten up. And I think you make the, the adjustments based on your observations. And I think 
you don't get in front of a group of people teaching without a whole lot of experience and know-how. So I think you have to <clears throat> sort of on a case-by-case -case basis see how um, see how the student can do and watch for what the challenges are and then adjust accordingly. That makes sense. And I don't want listeners to think that I'm beating the dead horse. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of intentionally asking questions that lead back to this very similar answer because I, I want to make sure people come away with that, that if you're having the conversations, if you're willing to come from a good place, that's going to come through. Right. I think we've all had exchanges with people in and out of the martial arts that if, if it's coming from a good place, you're much more tolerant. How many of us as martial artists have been punched in the face when we shouldn't have been, when the control wasn't there and it hurts, but you shake it off because the person wasn't trying to hurt you? Mm. We let these things go because we recognize people's intent. So mm -hmm. if you focus on the good intent, I think it, it's going to happen. And, and, and I think when you were talking about working with a child with a, new, a diagnosis that you were not experienced with, it sounds like that's what you're doing. You're being honest and saying, I don't have experience with this, but I'm going to learn. Mm -hmm. right. that is, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that right, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to learn. And, and introduce the topic and give, provide the lesson and model the movements and see if the person can do the movements. And if, and if it looks right and feels right, then chances are it's right. And if it's challenging, then you step back a little bit and you try it a little bit differently. And you ask them, what is a way that you could do this? Because it's got to be a back and forth, too. Um, <clears throat> and I don't, wouldn't necessarily want to toss one thing in here, Jim. Like one thing is, Please. a lot of times when you're teaching a person, um, any, any kind of teaching, visuals and watching is sometimes way better than talking and words. Do this. Mirror me. Copy this. You know, and then make a movement um, is sometimes a lot more powerful and poignant than put your right arm up here and, you know, um, then put your left leg over here, you know, like, mm. I mean, just mirroring and modeling and then looking for the comfort in, in the learner. And if, if the learner looks comfortable and appears safe, then I would say continue with the teaching. And if they don't back up a little bit and maybe figure out what the interference is. And, and one sure of my expectations sorry. high as a therapist, that's what I do, but I, and I don't know if that expectation would be too high for a teacher, but that's where I say it, it is a little bit of a team approach where you're going to have to talk to the learner. You're going to have to talk. I think if you have a person who's significantly involved, you'd probably want to have a conversation with their parent or with their, maybe even if they have therapists, uh, physician, you know, you want to make sure that you're keeping folks safe. And so if you have somebody who's significantly involved, then you probably want to double check and make sure that they're safe to be participating in such a sport. It's no different than when children participate in Special Olympics or unified sports, you know, just need to have a, don't have to every time, but sometimes need to have a doctor's release or like, is this safe for you? And once you have that, then, you know, you can proceed. That makes all kinds of sense. Mm -hmm. And of course, the thing I'm going to throw in, start from a place of fun. Right. I would imagine you 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 deal with that with the student population you're working with. If they're not having fun with the exercises or the drills or or whatever you're working with them on, they're going to tune out. Well, Master Thomas is um, somewhat new with our local class. I think um, you know it's just started this fall, and that is something that she has brought to our program that has been amazing and significant. Is that our students want to come back every week because they have fun and because she's willing to have fun with them, they have developed an even deeper respect for her. Mm. Totally. Yeah. Right. Anything else, anything else that the people listening might, might not know or questions I might not be thinking to ask? Um, I don't know that I touched on I, I, the, I talked a little bit about the research, but the research supports all kinds of individual exercise activities. Movement is good and martial arts is individualized and it's, you know, great for so many reasons. Um, you know, that I'm, I'm sure that probably all of you could speak to even as well as, if not better than I 
the, the concentration required, the coordination, the confidence building, um, the physical benefits of movement and exercise and breath support and um, organ health from being standing up and weight bearing, uh, the discipline involved, the increased focus and concentration um, has been you know, well researched that all of those things are good and they all fall within the scope of martial arts. It's almost like you could go and get everything you need by, see I'm convincing myself to start training in martial arts again. <laughs> but uh, it's such a, you know, it just is such a valuable <clears throat> um, resource. And the thing that's so great about martial arts is that you know, you could be beside, you could be, you know, your first or second class and you could be next to somebody much higher in rank and you both could still be learning and you can be learning from each other. And I think that's fabulous. And I just want to throw out another, um, we yeah. have a local class and this was just an incidental benefit that nobody even thought about or, or necessarily um, counted on. And, um, I just observed it at one of the Saturday morning classes. We had several students there, several the students all, we, we, this was not an integrated class. This was all learners with challenges and students with disabilities. And their parents got to stand on the sideline and watch their child participate in a sport. And it's something, you know, there was a sort of camaraderie among this group of parents. And it was something that they, several of them had never had the opportunity to do before because when you have a child who has a significant difference in how they learn and participate in life you can't put them on the little league team or the soccer team or the boy scout club or you name it you know and so having an individualized program that is also a group learning experience that was one thing that was just amazing and parents were really um very um notably noticeably um, enjoying their time on the sidelines, watching their child learn and participate. Hmm. That's wonderful. I, I hadn't even thought of it in we that didn't way, either. but yeah. <laughs> yeah, we didn't either. And, and it's not just, cool. and I also want to toss in, it's not just parents of children. I, 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 I often make the reference to children because I'm a pediatric occupational therapist, but it was, you know, adult learners, I'm sure, you know, would be the same. Right, right. Here, here's a, here's a group of people and here's an opportunity. And this is, you know, this is, this is why we're doing this, right? I mean, we're, we're trying to lend some support to an organization that I think is doing wonderful things, but it's all under the heading of it's an opportunity for martial arts and martial artists. Right. It's an opportunity for us to reach more people, to help more people, right. and by extension, help the world in a way that a lot of other aspects of, of life, a lot of other professions, a lot of other pursuits don't have the opportunity to do. Right. There is a, there is a phenomenon about working with people who have different ways of learning um and when it's all said and done and everybody walks away to find out who got more out of it mm -hmm. and oftentimes it's the people who were the helpers that are definitely the ones that are you know just very fulfilled and better off for it and one more time uh, if people want to learn more about the organization where would they go sure it's the adaptive martial arts association we have a website that's adaptive martial arts all one word dot org. Um, we do have a national directory that links students uh, with differences in learning to um, dojos and senseis and instructors who are willing to take on adaptive students. Um, the websites and our organization is um, ever evolving and um, looking to improve our uh, supports, but we already have a good pretty already have a pretty good um, list of resources and supports on the website and um, there is an opportunity to um, join the AMA as a, as a member or uh, make a donation to um, help us with our mission. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Jeremy, and thank you for um, having us on. Two wonderful conversations with two wonderful people helping a wonderful organization. I, I mean, I don't know what else to say. I hope that you will go and check out the website. I hope you will consider making a contribution. I hope that, if nothing more, you've learned something. Martial arts is for everyone. The tools that we have available to us as martial artists, the personal growth, the physical growth, there is so much there. And most of you already know this. 
So I'm asking for your help in spreading this message in bringing this idea to the schools around you. Let's open martial arts up to more people. Go ahead, check out the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, episode 467. We've got links. Of course, it's adaptivemartialarts.org. And you can find that link right there in case it's inconvenient for you to write it down. If you go to whistlekick.com, you're going to see everything that we're working on all at once. Use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% in the store and help us out in some way that makes sense to you, whether that's the Patreon or sharing an episode or social media, which is at Whistlekick all over the place. If you want to suggest a guest, we'd love to hear those suggestions. If you want to email me, it's jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 